Okay, now you can hear me. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday for those that are here live. Happy whatever day it is for those, whatever day you tune in, another day that we can get a little bit better. That's all God asks. Just a little better every day. God's patient. We're not, but he's patient. We've got a whole life just to inch forward. I think one of the great challenges that we have is that we all want to get everything done immediately. So we don't take the right steps to just to move in the right direction just slowly every single day. Learn how to walk step by step. And it's an honor to be with you right now. It's sunny Friday. Thank God. I love sunny Fridays in the summer. This is a special day today for those who get timeless lessons. This is the video that we send out every week, weekend. This is a, we're going to talk about the holiday. This is a hidden holiday that's, take, that, that's taking place today. What is it? Find out on Timeless Lessons. Okay, today is the Q&A day. I've got some great questions. I want to focus on a few today. One is coming from Rebecca. Uh, in yesterday's show, you said that if we were, she wrote in today's show, she sent it yesterday. Uh, in, in yesterday's show, you said that if we're journaling, chunking gets easier. Can you explain how it will get easier from journaling? Um, P.S. I've been journaling for two months now. Thank you. Look at that. Journaling for two months from the boost. It's one of the four things. I, are you doing the index card? And you're getting closer to your ideal. Amazing. Rebecca, thank you. You make it worth it. Okay. Why does journaling, why is journaling and chunking connected? So for those who are uh, with us and didn't catch yesterday's show, we spoke by the idea of chunking. Chunking is taking uh, time and bringing them down into very tangible, uh, small or units. Why is journaling and chunking uh, connected? And the answer is, is because it's all about self-awareness. It's all about asserting, asserting your mind over your world. So when you're used to understanding your day, when you're used to looking at your life, you see what journaling really does, if you do it correctly, is journaling creates perspective because it creates distance right? When you're going through your day, you're in the game and you're just doing your thing. You're operating from a, a perspective of being in the weeds. Now, if you go to bed, wake up the next morning and go in your day, all you really are doing is you're in your day. There's no moment where you now step outside and observe your day. For the football fans in the room, you know that there are coaches that sit in the booth. There's a game being played on the field and in the booth, which is on the top of the stadium, there's a booth where coaches are sitting and they're watching it from, the, from a higher perspective and they're calling in place to the head coach because it's perspective they're gaining. What we're doing is climbing to the booth. When you're journaling, you're, you're, not, you're, you're looking at your life, but from, a, from an observer. It's very powerful. So you're able to look at what you did and analyze it. So you're asserting your mind on your life. Now, when you do that, you're much more able to make shifts and make moves. Right? Just like it's easier for someone on the top to make a larger decision than if you're on the ground. The ground is to act but from the top is to strategize. So when you're journaling, you're getting aware of your environment. You're getting aware of, of what's happening in your life. You're building an awareness, an observer awareness. And as a result, you're much, it's easier for you to figure out when and how to create your chunking and then how and why it's working or not working. If you're in the game at all time, where are you going to start drawing the lines to chunk? But when you're on top, you can say, okay, I'm looking at my day. I'm looking at my challenges. I'm looking at my emotional um, willpower drop. I'm looking at my schedule. I really could, right? Someone who's, who, who's an observer of his life goes, okay, wait a second. Every time I come home and I'm with my family, I'm always thinking of work. Truth is, over the course of my month, year, I haven't really had any major emergencies that couldn't get dealt with an hour from now. So why am I carrying the phone around? Like, I'm not an ER doctor, right? That's the, the, the expression we have in our home. We're not ER doctors. 
you don't need to have your phone on you at all times if you're in the house, right? Like you can keep it in a room and check it every few minutes or every half an hour. Like no one is calling like, oh my gosh, I needed to reach you. So why do we carry it with us when you're home? Okay, if you're on the road, where are you going to put it? But if you're home, right, that's an observer's perspective. Wait a second. Let me question my behavior. Not because I'm criticizing the behavior. It's because now that I'm taking perspective, I'm realizing there's, there's a disconnect. Having your phone on you at all time for all, really comes because you need it. But you don't really need it. Right, I, I learned this when it comes to social media. I have a very interesting relationship with social media. We use it to, to post. I try very hard to never be on it to review. And the reason is because I find it just sucks time out of my day. It doesn't give me much. If you like social media and you want to see people are doing it, fine. You go on like once a day, maybe. But it, it has a way of creating this like constant pull. That's an observer mentality. And then you can, it gets even more complex the more you delve into it, the more you recognize, wait a second, I really enjoyed the time I spent with him today and not with him yesterday. Why? Oh, it's because today I was fully invested. Okay, every time I have this meeting, or I'll tell you another one, you ever get into a meeting with somebody and they're on their phone the whole time? You ever do that? And you're like, this is so offensive. You ever have to, it happens to me all the time. Not hopefully, actually it depends on who it's with, to be honest with you, if I could be totally honest. Depends on the age. I, I'll, I'll, sit, I'll sit in one-on-one -on -one meetings with people sometimes and they'll be on their phone. And I'm like, are you out of your mind? I'm thinking in my head. I wish I had the guts to say it, but I don't. Or I don't know if it's guts. I don't know if it's guts. I guess it's the sensitivity of not wanting to offend somebody, but like it is or at a meeting of four or five people and the person's looking at his stuff. I'm like, really? We're having a meeting about something. Just, it's 10 more minutes. And then I remember, wait, you do that too. You do that too. You gotta, so when you pull back and go, okay, I gotta create this time zone now. When I walk into this meeting, all I have is this meeting. Because remember how offensive it was when someone else looked at their phone? Remember how, oh, remember that, okay. That's a journal entry. That's a journal entry. I'm sitting in a meeting today. I couldn't believe how offended I was. Wait a second, I do this too. Remember, next time you walk into a meeting or into a conversation or you go out for lunch with a friend, leave your phone in your bag. Put the ringer on in case someone needs to reach you, but leave it in your bag. Journaling creates awareness. And awareness enables you to... Um, to assert greater control in your environment. And that's really where chunking is. You're asserting much greater control in your environment. Thanks. Um, thank you, uh, Rebecca. Okay. Steven, um, thank you for watching and you've been journaling too. Awesome. Um, Gratitude, you're great. Awesome with the gratitude. Uh, here's the issue. I give, but I'm resentful, which bothers me because there are people I feel I'm being used. Ah, good question, Stephen. So I don't know how to deal with resentment from them. Phenomenal question. Do you hear his question? You give all you want. We talk about being a giver, but what are people that are not reciprocate that don't reciprocate and you resent them for it? Okay. Important. Let's begin. Here's another expression that we try to think about here. If you're giving, give without return. The idea of giving is being able to give somebody something and to expect nothing in return from it. That's what giving is. When we are in a situation and we start to give, especially people that we're close to, a spouse, a child, family members, people at work. We expect that if I'm giving to them, then they're going to return at least with gratitude, right? At least with, oh my gosh, do you ever give to somebody? You ever like give somebody a gift 
that took you a while to give, whether it was small to them, but for you it was a big deal. And they're like, oh, thanks. It like diffuses it. You just want the gratitude. You don't want anything in return. You just want the acknowledgement, right? When you're giving, you're not free if you're giving to get. And if all you're getting is still a thank you, it's still some shackle in the gift. You need the acknowledgement, right? Mom and dad don't give their one-year-old milk to get a thank you. They give the kid milk because they're just giving to the kid for their own sake. And whether the thank you comes or not, it's irrelevant to them. They're free. They're free to be givers. And it changes as the kids get older. And we think it's because we're trying to train the kids. It's not because we, we want the thanks ourselves. That's why when you give a, an 11-year-old milk in the morning, you're like, did you say thank you? And if you give a one-year-old milk in the morning, you can care less. Because we train ourselves to expect something in return from our children when we, as they get older. We think it's to train them. We don't want them to be spoiled brats, but it's also for us. We're being fully honest. We want the gratitude. We're doing the work. We're in the middle of something. The kid needs something. We're going to go help them. At least say thank you. Okay, your younger brother's one years old. I'm not going to expect it from you. I expect it from Then the kid gets older and older, et cetera. Now, you have to train the kids to be grateful. But distinguish between training and what I need. And you see it. Mom and dad will give a 10-year-old something. They won't say thank you. And there'll be a little bit of resentment. And then you'll sit down and you go, wow, this kid's turning with this, whatever. So the, the, the level of giving needs to be giving for nothing in return, just for the sake of giving. And if you're with us next week, you're going to see that a lot of what we're talking about with happiness is this. It's giving in a free way. I'm just giving. And the reason is because giving is a, is a rebuilding of you. Giving is the rebuilding of you. What do I mean? I mean, you are a vessel. And your va- we spoke about this, I think, last week. And the vessel either has a, it's funny, we spoke about it very differently last week, but we'll, you'll see how it's two different sides, right? On the one side, the happiness piece of you needs to capture everything. But on the other side, when it comes to giving of something, when you can see yourself, almost picture it as um, you're a vessel, like a faucet. And when God gives you benevolence, when he gives you what we call in Hebrew shefa, shefa is like bounty, spiritual bounty. A part of it, from what I understand, of how it draws down into your life comes as to where is it going. So a person who is given lots of money is given lots of money because he has to, or she has to do something with that money. If you take all the money and keep it for yourself, it's not going to really last. And either it will last because it'll be more distasteful for you, or it'll last, you may lose it in your lifetime, or you may lose it in your generational lifetime. You just stick around long enough and keep your eyes peeled enough, and you'll see this is true. The people that get a lot of things in life and keep it for themselves, either it becomes distasteful for them, or they lose it at some point, whether themselves, their children, whatever. It just doesn't, it doesn't last. It's not built that way. If, you, if someone's a person where they are getting and then they're giving through, it doesn't mean you have to give everything away, right? There are rules and boundaries, but you're, you're a pass-through entity. You're a, you're a, you're a pipe. You're, there's no blockages in the pipe. The water flows through cleanly and you recognize that you're, what ends up happening is more comes in and you get stronger. So we don't give because we need in return. We give because giving is good for us. Giving builds us. And honestly, if we really want to talk about this for a second, and we should, we're going to try to hit this next week, if you think about the strongest way, like what would be the greatest muscle you work on in your life, it would be giving. 
Gratitude really is to get you to giving. Because once you become a giver, you're bulletproof. Nobody can, can knock you down. You're always in giving mode. God's the ultimate giver and he gets no respect. Think about it. God gives us everything, breath, and people forget about him, say he's not there, curse him. There's a, some guy does something wrong because he's given free will and we blame God for it. Like God gets rocked by the entire world. He doesn't stop giving, right? The guy, the atheist who's out there with a huge crowd proving to the world that there's no God, he doesn't like stop breathing in the middle. He doesn't like just disintegrate. So there is a sense of just giving no matter what. It builds you into becoming the most powerful resource in the world. And by the way, when you see like major, major, major uh, holy people, you go to Israel and see some like massive holy person, you'll see they're living in this tiny little place and they're just giving. And, they're, and when they're giving, they're like literally, they're, they're, they're bulletproof. Someone comes in yelling at them, they're totally calm. Someone's complimenting them, they're totally unhit. They're not like, there's no ego. Someone needs something, they're with them. Do you ever notice this? Because they're evolved as a giver. So when you have people that you give to and that you resent, two things happen right now. First is it allows you to deepen your giving. You're, why am I resentful for? For what? What do I need? They don't say thank you. Do I need them to say thank you? Can I, can I work on myself to be able to give without a thank you, knowing I did the right thing? I find this a lot when you watch a lot of commando stuff. I read and watch commando things. Because I think commandos are awesome. What shocks me, more than anything in the world when it comes to the world of commandos, is there are guys out there Let's just take America, where I live, and Israel. And you'll see, on, in both cases, Israel, sometimes in a more intense way, there are commandos doing raids, killing bad guys, saving people up, saving people, and then when they're done, they go back to life. There's a great story about a raid that took place in Beirut, Lebanon, against the PLO. It was during Black September. In October, I think in the 70s? Black September was in the 60s or 70s. Someone will tell me right now. It's probably, it's going to be either Nirla, Liran. I'm going to guess who gets it first. Andy, someone's going to get this first. I know. When was Black September? And, or maybe. And they had this massive raid in the defense of, of Israel. 1970. Thanks, Andy. And there's a story where Ehud Barak, who then became prime minister, but was at the time a commander in a elite force called Sayeret Matkal. This is a great story. This is a great story. You're going to love this story. This exactly proves the point. They, they, they had to go, you know, undercover in Beirut to hit their target. So they get to the, to the shores and they put on their scuba gear and they swim to the to the um, to the shores, but they have to make it look like they're not on a, on a raid. So they dress up like two people taking a walk, a man and a woman. So half of the commandos are dressing up like ladies, dresses, lipstick, make up the whole deal, and they're just walking in Beirut on the promenade or whatever. And then they go do their stuff. So Ehud Barak has a great story where he dresses up like he goes to Beirut on a mission, dresses up like a woman, walks hand in hand with his fellow compadre or comrade, right? Goes into this, finds the terrorist, takes them out, runs back, goes back into the boat and comes back to Israel. This is now like two o'clock in the morning. Goes to bed, he's wiped out. His wife wakes up in the morning and sees her husband came home at two o'clock in the morning with a, a dress, and lipstick on him still, right? Like, can you imagine? And she's like, you, and he's like, no, 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 it was a raid. He's like, what? And she, he couldn't even tell his wife who thinks, who knows what? 
And he couldn't even tell his own wife that he risked his life for the state of Israel and for the Jewish people. Where's his thank you? These guys walk the streets. Look, they look to the left, look at the kids are playing. They're waiting online to get a shawarma and there's four people cutting them off. Are they like, are you out of your mind? You know what I did last night? I almost died for you. Where's the respect? There's a certain, there's a certain, like, I guess, like, okayness. I don't need you to say thank you. I knew I was doing, I knew what I was doing was right. I don't need you to tell me that. Very hard, very powerful. We're commandos of life. And there are people in our lives that we give things to and they don't show us respect, they don't show us gratitude. It doesn't mean we have to stop giving. It doesn't mean the Operation Bayonet. I think in this show, I hope that we go through every major or minor operation, the Israeli operation, that'd be amazing. It doesn't mean that we stop. Now, let me just give you one more bit of advice on this. But it does mean you have to calibrate. And what I mean with this is, if you feel too much resentment, pull back a drop. Just like if you feel too much pain under a set of weights, you don't keep on rolling because you're going to rip. Right? If you get to a gym and they hand you 500 pounds and you're like, I can't do it. Take off the bells and keep it at 100. Right? If you're, if you're in a relationship and you're giving, 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 and the person's not ready to, to, to give back at all and you're ready to kill them, pull back. Give a little less, but, but work on the muscle. Whatever you give, give with your full heart because then you're building the right muscles and they'll get stronger. You're doing the exercise correctly. And even if it's for a small group, and then you get more, and then you get more, and then you get more. It's always better to calibrate your relationships so that you don't resent people but at the same time, just like you're doing anything else and you're ritualizing and getting stronger at it, get stronger at giving just to give. Nothing that we need in return other than the knowledge that we are becoming the people we're meant to be and God knows. And sometimes the greatest rewards we get are when we do things that no one knows but him. Okay. Have a great weekend, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Uh, enjoy the summer weekend. Next week, we're going to continue in the world of, um, of empowerment through meaning. If you want to get timeless lessons, you don't have it, charlie at charlierari.com. Uh, and you can listen to this on all these different platforms. And if you're, get, if you're out there listening to this on demand and you want the links, let us know where you listen. And... Um, and we will send it to you. Also, for those who are interested today, 5.30, projectinspire.com. We do our Shabbat show. Uh, okay, hope all is well. Take care. And with God's help, cannot wait to see you again on Sunday.